today we're going to be talking about preprocessors in modern web development. A preprocessor is a tool that translates one language into another. And during this video, we're going to be talking about SAS, or CSS, which is translated into CSS, HAML, which is translated into HTML, and CoffeeScript, which is translated into JavaScript. These are three of the most popular preprocessed languages available at the moment, although there are plenty more if you go looking. Now, the fundamental question is, why would we use a preprocessor in the first place? What are the advantages to using these new style languages? And fundamentally, the problem we have is that CSS, HTML, and JavaScript were very old languages and were designed a long time ago, before modern web applications were anything near as complicated as they are now. So while they're good languages, there are a lot of limitations, kind of flaws, and missing features that have been causing problems for web developers for a long time. Unfortunately, it's very slow and difficult to update these languages, so we can't simply add these new features within any kind of reasonable time frame. What we can do, however, is use a preprocessor to enable us to use a more sophisticated language that has support for all the new features we want as developers, but then gets compiled to the existing language that is properly supported in all existing browsers. So we can use all of these new features, we can use all of these new techniques, but we're not actually relying on anything to be changed about the user's browser. We're still delivering our web applications using a set of technologies that are standard and available everywhere. I'm going to walk through each of these languages, SAS, HAML, and CoffeeScript in turn, and give you a brief overview of the core features of the language, how the new syntax works, and give you an idea of the advantages you might find in using these new languages. Firstly, we're going to look at SAS, or Syntactically Awesome Style Sheets. So I'll just bring up the website for that, which is here, sas-lang.com. Uh, SAS is essentially CSS as it should have been developed. It's probably the most popular of all the pre-compiled languages, and in my experience, this is the language that makes the most difference to your web development. Uh, CSS is really awkward and clunky and very difficult to scale to large websites, and SAS has built-in features that deal with most of the fundamental issues in CSS in a very simple and streamlined way. I basically won't work in CSS by itself anymore. I will only ever build websites in SAS or something like it because it's so much more convenient. SAS is what's called CSS compatible, as you can see on their website. Essentially what that means is any CSS code is also valid SAS code, but SAS adds a whole bunch of new features that aren't available in raw CSS. So you can cut and paste your old CSS into your SAS and there won't be any problems associated with that, but you can write your new code as proper SAS, which will be cleaner and uh, much neater. Now, I'm not going to show you all the features available in SAS. If you're interested in learning more, check out the documentation they have up here. But I will show you the four most important, nesting, variables, mixins, and extensions. To start with, I'll show you some SAS code on the left-hand side in Sublime Text here, and the equivalent CSS code on the right here. You can see they're not very different in length, but the SAS code is much more maintainable, and you'll start to see why as we explain. Now, the first feature is nesting. Uh, in CSS, you can see on the right, you can have nested selectors. You could say have nav ul, which means any ul's are inside navs, or nav li, etc., etc., which allows you to have quite specific selectors and style things by whether they're inside another thing. Uh, what SAS does is makes this substantially better and allows you to say have the nav selector here and then the ul selector inside that. And when we uh, compile our SAS, it will actually compile this whole tree of, of nested selectors and then turn them into these linear selectors here. However, as you can see on the left, this is much more readable and easier to maintain. We can see very clearly that all this stuff here is inside nav. And, for example, if I wanted to add some styles to paragraphs inside uh, URLs, I could do um, something like this, and it would be handled automatically. That there would generate a selector that looks at something like nav ulp uh, font weight bold. Um, when you start getting really large uh, style sheets, in particular when you have style sheets that are styling very specific parts of your page, headers, footers, whatever, this nested hierarchy really lets you see the structure of things very clearly and makes it a lot more transparent, uh, easier to work with. The next big thing that SAS allows us to do is define variables, something that should be but definitely isn't in CSS. We can see on the left here we have two variables defined, font stack, which is Helvetica sans serif, and then primary color, which is in this case a 666, kind of a gray color. And then we're using both those variables, so the font uh, goes to the font stack variable, the color goes to primary color. And that will be compiled by the SAS preprocessor, and we'll get this here, body, 
will have font 100% Helvetica sans serif and then the color will change there. What this means, however, is that we could change this variable in one place, say change that to 333, like so, and the uh, body tag here that would be output in CSS would also change. In this example, it's actually more verbose, but if we're using that primary color 20, 30, 40 times in our website, and we wanted to change it all at once, if it was stored in a variable, in kind of a variables or a constants file in our CSS, it would be really easy to make those changes site-wide. Whereas in traditional CSS, you would have had to go through, probably using search, find and replace, and find every single last one of them in your style sheets. This is immensely handy and can save you huge amounts of time. The next big function SAS gives us is the mixin. Mixin is much like a function in another language. It allows us to define a snippet of uh, CSS and pass arguments into that snippet so that it can be reused all over our style sheets. I've got an example here that's pulled from the uh, SAS website that shows us, just delete that from now, that shows us how to set up a mixin that allows us to quickly use border radius properties on our classes or whatever without having to write it out manually every time. So if you look on the right hand side, you can see the current way of doing border radius and CSS is really clunky. Because it's a new property, you have to put uh, the special prefixes for different browsers in for each of those browsers to interpret it. So we have the border radius property here, but we also have a prefix for Opera, one for um, Internet Explorer, one for Firefox, one for Safari, etc. So you can see there are five lines of almost identical code just to do border radius, and it's very tedious. On the left, we have an example of how to set up a mixin to handle this. So we have a border radius mixin, which takes one argument, uh, the dollar sign radius there, and that generates all these lines of code for us, border radius, and then one with each of the prefixes. And that radius uh, argument gets passed to each of those. So then we can do something like dot box, include border radius 10 pixels. That 10 pixels will be passed here to each of these arguments, and we'll get uh, when we compile this to CSS, a series of border radius properties with 10 pixels in each one. Where well, this comes in really handy, because again, in this example, because we're only doing it once, it's actually more verbose than SAS, is if we were doing border radius stuff all over the place. So we could have another class called corners and include border radius, this time with 20 pixels, and that would give us this. So a very similar looking class in CSS, but with 20 pixels passed in. Now, while you can write your own mixins really easily, the beauty of SAS is that there are a lot of frameworks or libraries available, things like Compass and so on, that have all these mixins or have a lot of common mixins available for you already. You can basically download big libraries of, of very useful mixins and use them in your sites. So things like border radius mixins are available all over the place. So you can save a lot of time by downloading and using these in your site. And then when you need to make custom ones, it's very straightforward and can save a lot of time. Now, the next big language we're going to be looking at is Haml. Uh, Haml is essentially a replacement for HTML, which is one of the old XML family of languages that have syntax that is pretty broadly regarded as quite horrible. Lots of closing tags, very clunky, verbose, and quite difficult for humans to read, which leads to unnecessary errors and all sorts of unpleasantness. So if we go to the uh, Haml website, you'll see they describe themselves. They're a Haml.info, by the way. They describe themselves as beautiful, well-indented, dry, clear markup. And you can see in the side-by-side -side comparison they have here, uh, on the left is ERB, which is essentially just HTML with Ruby inside it, and on the right is Haml. Uh, Haml is largely used with uh, Rails stack and uses Ruby syntax, but you can use Haml outside Rails, and there are other languages that are very similar to Haml that can be used with different frameworks. So the principles here are relevant, even if you're not a Rails developer. You can see on the left, the syntax is quite clunky, lots of quote marks, closing tags, things like that. It's just painful. And on the right-hand side, you've got something that's kind of much cleaner and simple, and the structure is very visible, very easy to read. So we're going to bring up side-by-side -side examples uh, here and here. On the left-hand side, we have some Haml code, and on the right, we have the equivalent HTML. Now, unlike SAS, you can see that Haml is much shorter. My experience is that it's kind of about two-thirds to half the length of the equivalent HTML, and it's so much easier to read, which really discourages you from making mistakes. Now, in particular, one of the big advantages it has is instead of uh, using 
its own syntax. You can see to make a div with id content, you have to say you know, div id equals content here and close the div down here. In Haml, you just say hash content, which is the same syntax as you would use in CSS, which means A, um, you're using the same syntax in both your, your HTML and your CSS, and B, you find it just kind of scans more easily. Uh, again, here, this is two classes. So dot left dot column, same syntax as CSS, and you can see that translates to div class is left column. Obviously, you can use uh, tags other than div. So if I did, for example, uh, video test, that's not how you use the video tag, by the way, but I'm just doing this for the sake of example. That would produce something like that. This. So you can see it's very quick to spit out whatever tag you want. Um, you can put classes on things. So, for example, video foo would be a video ID equals foo, like so. And you can even put attributes on things. For example, I could go uh, source foo. Um, and that would say source equals foo, like so. Uh, you'll also see, obviously, that uh, Haml is white space sensitive, which means you can't write badly formed Haml very easily. There's no way to accidentally forget to close tags. It will throw errors and exceptions if you try. And when you scan the page, it means that the indentation always represents the uh, structure. Um, it's just much shorter, much easier to see where things are, and it's easy to see what's inside what. Um, my experience, again, is once you start working on large sites with a lot of different little partials and very complicated layouts, this makes all the difference in terms of how easy it is to find where you should be working and what you should be doing. It's actually very difficult when you get very large HTML files to work out where things close, and you accidentally break stuff all the time. Now, I don't find there are very many downsides to using Haml. Uh, the biggest problem is essentially that when you're working in the browser debugging with something like Firebug, you are debugging the actual HTML it spits out rather than the Haml you're working with. So you have to kind of translate in your head from one to the other when you're looking to see what's wrong. I've never found that hugely problematic. It takes a couple of days to get used to when you first start working in Haml, but after a little while it becomes second nature. And very occasionally you run into specific kind of bits of HTML syntax that the Haml syntax isn't really friendly with and causes issues. But you can actually just write raw HTML inside Haml as text. So if there's something you need to do in HTML, but for whatever quirk of the Haml compiler you can't do easily in Haml, you just write that as HTML and your problem solved. Now the last big language we're going to be looking at is CoffeeScript, which compiles to JavaScript. Now, CoffeeScript is very much the most contentious of these three examples. SAS, there aren't really many problems with. Haml, there aren't really many problems with. CoffeeScript is simultaneously really awesome and potentially uh, a big issue at the same time. So there's a lot of argument on the internet as to whether you should use it, whether you shouldn't. If you look at the uh, CoffeeScript website, coffeescript.org, you'll see that once again, it's kind of a neater, cleaner version of the uh, same language. Just to wrap up, I'm going to run you through some basic examples of CoffeeScript syntax. If you want to learn more, again, check out the CoffeeScript website, because we'll only be touching very briefly on the course syntax elements here. So once again, we bring up Sublime Text, and on the left we have example.coffee, which is the CoffeeScript, and on the right we have example.js, which is the JavaScript output. So some things that are uh, visible in this example first. I want in CoffeeScript, you don't need to use the there keyword. So you can see here, we've defined all these uh, variables at the top using there. In CoffeeScript, you can just automatically assign to them and the there keyword will be automatically inserted if that uh, variable doesn't exist. You'll see uh, line endings in JavaScript have a semicolon, line endings in CoffeeScript don't. And you'll see here when we're looking at this object, uh, in JavaScript, we need to use curly braces and commas to delineate our structure. Whereas in CoffeeScript, we can just use uh, indentations like so, and we can build our structures that way. Writing a function in CoffeeScript is very similar. You could do something like this, uh, which is basic function syntax. If we wanted to pass in arguments, we could do something like this, a1, a2, terrible variable, uh, terrible argument names, but still. Whereas in JavaScript, we'd have to do something like foo equals um, function a1, a2, uh, and then open the curly braces and do stuff there. You can see the syntax is quite a bit cleaner. Um, lastly, CoffeeScript gives you all sorts of little helpers that help deal with common issues in JavaScript. For example, and if you're not a JavaScript developer, this might not mean much to you. If you change the dash there to an equal sign, uh, CoffeeScript will fix the way that the this keyword is assigned, so it will refer to the scope that the function was defined in. 
You can also access the this keyword using the at sign. So at foot is equivalent to this dot foot. That comes in really handy in a whole bunch of different um, design patterns when building JavaScript applications. So that's our quick rundown of SAS, Haml, and CoffeeScript. Now, these three tools between them have dramatically improved my workflow personally. I spent about half the time doing client-side and front-end work I used to, and I work on projects that are far larger in scale and scope than anything I would have been able to handle back in the days when I was using more JavaScript and so on. So check these things out, read the documentation, have a play, download some tools, and see what you think. Thank you.